Hey folks, it's a match once again, and this is actually a review I was going to do later, but I'm like, I wanted to do it now. This is a film that I saw a trailer for, and it really intrigued me, and then I heard really good fr things from my best friends, Efri and Mike, OCP Communications. So I blind bought this movie called Mandy. And this is a slipcover, but what's cool is that there's a reversible sleeve. And I really like that cover. That's a really, really cool cover. In the back there. And I, bl I rarely blind buy a movie, but hell, if you get on VOD, it'd be pretty much the same price as this cost. And it's one of those things that when I was starting to watch it, I'm like, I'm liking this. When I got halfway through, I'm like, okay, maybe, you know, top ten, you know. And then when I got like 70% in, I'm like, yeah, top five of the year. And then when the end credits started to play, I'm like, Yep, this is one of my favorite films of the year. I highly enjoyed this film. My number one will still be Searching with John Cho. That just touched a special place in my heart. But I would say this is number two. Mandy is a great cinematic experience. And sadly, we do not get that a lot nowadays. Now, I've only seen bits and pieces of the director's previous film, Beyond the Black Rainbow, but the bits and pieces I saw looked great visually, but I wasn't sure about the ending, and I don't know, maybe I have to give it a fair look. But the director's Panos Cosmatos, and if that last name sounds familiar, he directed films like his father, George P. Cosmatos, did films like Leviathan, which is a personal favorite of mine. Yes. This is by the son of George P. Cosmatos, who also worked on that movie, Cobra. It's funny, like two films on my wall is George P. Cosmatos movies. I know people say, well, technically Stallone directed Cobra, whatever. George P. Cosmatos, the stuff he did in Leviathan of a known origin, both with Peter Weller, I'm sure he did something with it. So it was cool to watch you know, his son take up the mantle of director. Because again, I have not seen the entire Beyond the Black Rainbow. But this, this is almost like if Rob Zombie made a good movie. If like this is the movie Rob Zombie wishes he could make, in a way. This is a film that... I know I did this moniker that I hate to everything. And then I mentioned, pick a year. I can name dozens of movies, no matter what year you pick, of movies I've reviewed and enjoyed. Last year, I loved John Wick Chapter 2, and Blade Runner 2049, and The Hitman's Bodyguard, and Baby Driver. Um, 2016, I enjoyed The Nice Guys. Zootopia really enjoyed, Money Monster with George Clooney, uh, the, you, have, you have Hardcore Henry, uh, this year Deadpool 2 I enjoyed, Mission Impossible Fallout, Accident Man with Scott Atkins, and there's a couple others, Searching with John Cho, I didn't pick a year, I'm just very picky, and... I honestly do feel like a lot of movies today are either run-of-the-mill or poorly made or piss poorly a generic or at best average at worst pieces of fucking trash or shit or overrated or junk overrated like the new Halloween film or junk like the new like skyscraper with the rock or pieces of fucking trash like the new Predator movie. Or, you know. And so I have to 
you're buried in this junkyard of trash and you gotta swim your way out to find pieces of gems like this and searching with John Cho among others I wish there were films like searching and, and this movie ten times a year <coughs> for some people there are and that's the point of view and that's their opinion that's their the way they see movies Sally that's not how I see it I think there's a lot of junk coming out from movies today and there's a couple gems in the in the can't even say a pool like a little pond there's a few gems in there that you scoop up and marvel and enjoy and this is one of them it's visually breathtaking the store by Johan Johansson, who passed away, Sally, fit the film like a glove. And it's the music that you heard in the trailer, among others. Nicholas Cage does a really good job. The whole cast, the guy who plays the villain, Linus Roach, very memorable villain. Uh, some lines of dialogue caught me off guard, especially at the end of the film. Bill Duke from Predator and Commando. He has only one scene in the film, but it was great to see him in the movie. It was, so I wish more movies had Bill Duke in it. Bill Duke is just a great presence to have. His look, his voice. Underrated actor, Bill Duke. And it was great to see him again in this movie. The pacing, I'm sure, will bother people. And at first it did bother me, the pacing. I'm like, isn't this a little bit too slow? Isn't there a couple stuff you could, you know, trim? Not cut, Maybe not cut out, but trim down a bit. Move it a little bit better pace. But I guess, after watching it completely... The thing with a slow burn, you have to be careful to make it worth it by the end for the audience. If it's not worth it, then you failed. But to me, the payoff was worth it. And a lot of great choices. I love a lot of the choices this director had with the movie, which I'll get into a little bit when I talk about spoilers. Because I really do feel the best way to go into this movie is to know as little as possible. That's why I didn't really watch much of my friend Mike OCP's review of this film. I know I reviewed it, uh, but I didn't watch much of it. Maybe like the first minute or two, but I didn't want to be spoiled. And I think for most people, if you want to check this film out, check it out, you know, as blind as you can be even if you if you haven't seen the trailer even better but actually I think it, I think I got like three four minutes in because I didn't want to be spoiled too much now, I'll watch the rest of it after I do this review but yeah this movie it makes me sad people are like what do you mean it makes you sad I thought you liked the film because God damn it, why can't more people make movies like this? I'm not saying carbon copies. I'm saying like this film on IMDb gets a 6.7, which is fucking low. But yet the new Halloween film gets like a 7.2. And if you like the new Halloween film, teach their own. But the reason I'm bringing it up is comparing the two. The new Halloween film is just regurgitated moments of the past Halloween flicks put together in a greatest hits trick-or-treat bag and a lot of people like it to each their own I prefer something like searching with John Cho I prefer something like this yeah you say nothing is original but try the director who did search with John Cho tried and succeeded Thomas Kamau's tried and succeeded in my opinion. It's funny you have to keep saying my opinion. 
If you're making the video, of course it's your opinion. Who the fuck else's opinion is going to be? I mean, this the director himself even said, because there's like a little 20 minute behind the scenes, and Elijah Wood is actually one of the producers. And you hear his voice a little bit on the behind the scenes. And Piles Cut Smiles pretty much talks about how he makes simple stories because for him, he wants to create a visual cinematic experience. I think he said it's not the story, it's about how you tell the story. And that's one way of going about it. If there's been so many fucking stories told that you're going to be repeating yourself, then try to impress us with how the story is told. And... You know, I looked at these Hollywood films that cost hundreds of millions of dollars, like Skyscraper, and they're just run-of-the-mill, forgettable, fucking, blinking it's gone from your system, crap fest. And then this film probably costs as much as the fucking catering on Skyscraper. Or the, that new Predator film. Or Solo, a Star Wars story, or whatever the hell it is. Maybe because I'm growing older and I want to see, it's hard to say new, but I want to see, and sometimes they'll try something new and it'll fail, but sometimes you get this. And the Village Voice said it best, insanely violent and ethereally beautiful. Ethereal, that's a great description of this movie. I mean, it's it's an LSD trip. The movie takes place in 1983, which is cool because that's the year I was born. And Nicholas Cage is, is with his love of his life, character Mandy. These people come in and bad shit happens and it becomes a revenge movie. Simple story, but it's how it's told. And I need to go into spoilers right now. But I'll say this. I know I'm repeating myself, but this is so... This this deserves more than a 6.7 IMDb. I don't know if it's because just... If... Believe me, I know how it goes with pacing. I've mentioned that word pacing a lot of times in movies. But this one is worth it. The music, the visuals, the cast. The style trying to be different from the pack of movies that we get 24-7 on your VOD and your theater streams. And this didn't get a, a wide theatrical release. I would love to have seen this in the theater. That would have been amazing. But we didn't get that. But, you know, if a piece of shit Transformers film comes out, that would get 8,000 fucking streams or whatever. But searching with John Cho had to go fucking far, far away. This one wasn't around here at all, even far, far away. And I'm glad I blind bought this. It was worth it. But getting more into spoilers, I'm just thinking of stuff off the top of my head that I liked. I like that <laughs> Nicolas Cage and his... His, I'm gonna call her Mandy because I can't pronounce the Andrea Riseborough. I'll just call her Mandy for short. Her character. They're watching a movie on TV and it's Night Beast, which is a film I've heard of. It came out I think '82 or something, and like this low-budget creature feature flick. But it's a film I've always been wanting to see, but I've seen clips and you know pieces of footage from it. So that gave me a chuckle that they're watching that film. Um, 
again, spoilers, when his wife is killed. Such a unsettling sequence where the sleeping bag, the woman is in there, and they're burning her alive in the sleeping bag. And there's been other movies that have done that type of kill, but the fact that they cut out the sound effects, like Nicholas Cage's reaction, and they it's silence, but then you hear one or two of the cult talking, and the music, and then when Nicholas Cage gets out, and he just sees his wife in ashes, I'm like, wow. That's fucked up. That's crazy, man. And then after it, he's so stunned, he doesn't know how to react. And that's the thing, he's in a daze, and he comes in, and there's a fucking commercial playing. That they, I believe they created this commercial for the movie, for an 80s commercial, for like Goblin Cheddar or something. So it's like this puppet goblin barfing this, you know, cheddar cheese on these kids, and the kids like, yay! And this dick was changed his dead pants, goblin cheddar. <laughs> so it's like, see, when people were like, oh, well, you complain that new Halloween film, and I was, you, you don't like comedy, there's levity, and then there's comedy. To me, like, that scene in this movie is levity, not comedy. And I do think there is a difference. And works within the, the, it's a really quirky thing. And it's like the director who helped write this film, once he got Nicolas Cage, it's almost as if he's like, okay, let's do some things because it's Nick Cage. So like, he goes after these biters, and these biters are like Hellraiser type motorcycle riders. The way the get up, it's kind of like if you took Again, the Cenobites and those guys from Hobo with a shotgun, with the armor on. And he he kills one of them, and he just takes, like, they have the cocaine, and the kid just takes it and sniffs it. <laughs> uh, or there's this one thing where... Before Bill Duke has this one, again, I, it's only one scene. I kind of wish he was in the movie more because I just love Bill Duke. But he explains a little bit of what these guys are. And let, you know, maybe this batch of LSD that was went wrong and they were never the same after taking it. And Nick Cage, like, takes a little dip of his finger into his mouth. I like the visuals of uh, the psychedelic crazy. Vi I can't even explain this, this little psychedelic trip he takes, but it's pretty wild and fucking crazy. Pretty insane, but I loved it. Certain, throughout the movie, there's certain chapter titles that pop up. Like uh, the titles will <coughs> push in amongst a black screen. And they push in as if it was an 80s movie, and the, the way the music, and maybe there's some, I don't want to say artwork, but some style that comes out of the the title and certain ones, or like chapter selections. Like details like that I enjoyed. <laughs> Sorry, I'm paused there because I think about the villain in this. The villain did a really good job. He was, you know, creepy. I did not think he was hamming it up. He wasn't going over the top. And he was he was playing the villain, sort of this cult leader, but I wouldn't I'm not gonna use the word humanizing, but there's a moment at the end that made me laugh where He's really buying to this whole, you know, I am the one, you know, this was your journey to follow me. But then as Nick Cage has him ready to crush his head, he loses it for a minute and doubts it as he's crying. This, this guy is like, I'll give you a blowjob, man. 
I'll suck your fucking dick. And then he gets out of it and then tries to get back his zeal. No, I am I am this bad guy. I was, that, uh, again, it wasn't out of the blue because it's like, it, it, in a weird way, it was a natural reaction that, you know, cult leaders, maybe they don't, and it was established even scenes earlier on that maybe he doesn't buy his bullshit a hundred percent. He has his doubts, and then he tries to psych himself out to get out of those doubts. And I didn't see that line coming, but that did make me laugh. But yeah, the first like hours of build up. Which I think a lot of people... It's a two-hour movie. Like, two-hour and one-minute movie. And I think for a lot... A good chunk of people, they just felt... That... Was too boring, honestly. But to me... And first watch, it was like... Okay, some pacing could be trimmed... In certain scenes. But I think on... on a second watch, it won't bother me because I know there's going to be a satisfying payoff. But yeah, I mean, there's a couple scenes. There's one scene where before the shit hits the fan, the this one guy, he, he makes this call that's going to get the bikers in. And this other asshole is playing with the automatic windows going up and down. Uh, like, that scene could have been trimmed. You know, th that scene went on a bit too long. So stuff like that could have been trimmed, and maybe enough trims you could take out like five minutes or so of the first half of the movie, and maybe that would have helped better. That's really my only nitpick of the film. Um, he gets this great axe, and he does put it into use. This one fucking cool moment, it gets thrown, and boom, right into the guy's head. He has a fight with a guy and cuts the fucking head off his biker. Uh, you got head crushing. Uh, the end of this, Axe has like a little like knife at the end and he shoves it in a guy's throat. I mean, you really get the satisfying revenge aspect. It definitely gets violent in the third act. You get it. Chainsaw duel, you get a crazed Nick Cage. And then really beautifully shot sequences. Like, he deals with the bikers, and then he goes see this, I guess, a chemist. Richard Brake is the actor's name. I recognize him from other movies. I think he was in that Rob Zombie one called 31, which I haven't seen, but I've seen bits and pieces. I'm like, right. I'm sorry, I'm not a fan of Rob Zombie's movies. Even The Devil's Rejects. I can appreciate the actors, but I'm just not a fan of the movie. I'm just not. It's one of those things, if I want to watch Devil's Rejects, I'd just rather watch the first two Chainsaw Massacre movies. Or oh, I'll watch this. I like this much more than any of Rob Zombie's movies. And that's why I said this is to me is the film Rob Zombie wishes he could have made. This is like, see, this is how you don't have your character say fuck 58 fucking times in three sequences. Which this doesn't, thankfully. But yeah, the. The, I was talking about the scene, Richard Brake, I think he was in that film, I think he was in the Doom movie with Dwayne Johnson, and again, just a really beautifully shot, well lit, it comes across this place in the middle of nowhere, and these lights, they pop up one after the other after the other, and it's this guy, this chemist, and it's like, who is this guy, and we haven't seen him before, we don't see him again, does he, how does he know anything? What's going on? And he just has this tiger, and then he lets the tiger go, and it's a movie that you're not, if you, it's not supposed to be realistic, <laughs> let me put it that way. <coughs> if you go into this thinking you're going to get a realistic movie, 
No, it's a it's an LSD trip of a movie, like I said. And it's one of those scenes where sorry. It's one of those things that it has at times when Nick Cage is asleep or unconscious. There's these animated little anime sequences that remind me of Heavy Metal from the 80s. And I love Heavy Metal. I reviewed that on my channel. I love Heavy Metal from the early 80s. It was cool to see that kind of animation again. Granted, they don't last too long, but there's a couple little ones in there. I thought that was really cool. The villains you really hate and you're glad when they get their comeuppance. It doesn't end on a shitty note. Which, nowadays, you have to... It's just what I prefer. Again, it's personal preference. Yeah, once in a while it can work if a guy like John Carpenter is doing it and he does it well. But, you know, for personal preference... I prefer a little bit more of the upbeat ending. Again, it's just a personal preference. And just how fun with the visuals, like the there's a moment where early on they capture this girl and they've given her these drugs and they put her in this room and when people move, it's like they move but yet their ghostly figure is there for a second and goes back to the person. Then they move and then this figure of themselves moves. Like almost like a blur type of thing. And just the usage of colors uh, in almost every scene. I know people would say this is style over substance. Maybe they have a point. But... It was refreshing to see, considering not only the many junk movies, in my opinion, that we've gotten this year, but you don't get movies like this anymore. You know how a lot of films, they or even TV shows, they want to talk about, oh, this is like the 80s, and this is like da-da-da. And a lot of times I watch them and I go, what the fuck? How is this like an 80s movie? What are you talking about? Or how is this like... What? You may think you're retro, but what the fuck are you talking about? This is one of those movies that actually does succeed it. And it didn't really market itself like that. It, I think it's filmed like that because it takes place in 1983, but I don't really think... I, at least I don't remember the marketing saying put too much in the 80s stuff. I don't know, a lot of people use that as a gimmick nowadays. But to me, this is one of those flicks that, that does work in that aspect. And this is a movie that I wish we would get more of. I wish we would get more movies like this. You know, these psychedelic type of flicks. But we're not. We're not. I mean, this is a film that gets a 6.7 on IMDb. This is a film that didn't get much theater, so not many people were able to see it compared to Skyscraper or compared to you know, other fucking things. Granted, I got some critical notices, which I appreciate. And maybe, you know, it'll live a life as a cult movie. But I do hope more people take notices from this film. And do a good job as well. It's one thing to take notes from it, but you have to do a good job too. A spiraling, surreal, bloody rampage of all-out, mind-altering vengeance. That's a good way to put it. 
I don't know what else to say about this without you know giving every single thing away. I was just really impressed by this film. I was not let down. Um, it's definitely I would say searching is number one because I touch the heart here. Uh, this is number two. This is easily on that level. I would I actually want to watch it again. That's when you know a friend of mine once said when you watch the end credits and you just you know enjoying the end credits, that's when you know you've seen a good movie. When you you send through the end credits. And it did it does make me want to go back and watch it again. That's how much I enjoyed this film. That's how much I really got it. What it's not a fast paced movie. If you're going to that, you're gonna be disappointed. So I guess that's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. But if you want an experience that they don't give out much nowadays, that they don't do much nowadays, that is a rarity compared to a lot of shit we did nowadays, definitely check this movie out. If, it's not, if you don't like it, teach their own. But... This is why I get so critical on a lot of these big budget movies. Not all of them. You know, I like Doctor Strange from Marvel. I thought that was one of the better Marvel movies for me. I liked, I didn't see the sequel, but I liked the first Ant-Man. I like popcorn movies when they're done well. And that's each person's personal perspective. But... You know, I looked at a film like The New Predator, or I looked at trash like Steve Plan 2, or I looked at overrated crap like the new Halloween film, or I looked at bullshit like a lot of stuff we got this year. I have to swim through that to get to, you know, Mission Possible Fallout, or Deadpool 2, or this movie, or Searching with John Cho. And, you know, watching movies like this and searching and stuff, you know, gives me, you know, the hope to keep going. Because I, I have a passion for movies. I have a passion for many different kinds of movies. From the 30s, you know, I like the Three Stooges and some of the Universal movies like Dracula and Frankenstein and The Invisible Man, which was the 40s. The Thing from Another World from the 50s, Red Skelton comedies he's done. Abben Costello. You know, I like action and all different kinds of decades. I like horror. I also like comedy. I also like some dramas. I got Castaway over there with Tom Hanks. Love that movie. Granted the trailer for Castaway gave away the entire fucking film, but you know, don't watch the trailer. Just watch the movie if you've never seen it. But Castaway, because I picked up the Blu-ray recently. Because I didn't have it. And I just noticed because it's over there. But. I don't know where I'm going with this. But. I watching this film just you know makes me smile. And be like. That's. Finding gems like Mandy. Is why I like. Going out on my way to search for movies. And find out about what movies are coming out. And a lot of times they're going to be movies that are under the radar. Like, you don't know it's coming out until a trailer pops up. Like, what the hell is that? Huh? The first John Wick was that. I didn't know anything about John Wick. Then I saw a picture of Keanu with a beard and a gun. I'm like, what the hell is that? It's, it seems like more and more nowadays, the it's the films under the radar, like Dread and Hardcore Henry and this movie and Searching and, and others that... And what's all a big movie like Blade Runner 2049, Deadpool 2, but and you gotta keep looking out there for it. Bam, anyway, I'm going on and on about it. I really enjoyed this film. Give it as much praise as I could. Thanks for watching. Take care, and we'll see you guys later. Bye bye.